for them to be able to accomplish what they have done and continue to do, I think we need to give them a very warm pachyderm welcome. Well, it is fun to be here today. It's always fun to come back to the pachyderm, and uh, actually I'm the second choice. Um, <laughs> not that anybody cares, but it was actually supposed to be Leo and Emil today, and Emil's uh, traveling somewhere, and so I was the second choice to, uh, to take over for Emil. So I told Leo, I said, I don't care if I'm the fourth choice. It's still good to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's all good. I will tell you, uh, you know, the, 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 I guess you call it a newspaper that we have here in Wichita, the Wichita Eagle. Uh, according to the Wichita Eagle, we don't work. We, uh, we, we, I, guess, I guess they think we work maybe less than 20 or 30 hours a week. I would ask them to come and join me at 6.30 in the morning and still at 6 o'clock at night when I'm still there and tell me I don't work 30 hours a week. So, just had to point that out. You know, we've had a really awesome year this year. We've done a lot of good things. Uh, not, not that the Eagle would agree with us that we've done a lot of good things, but we've done a lot of good things. Uh, we really started out this year with one thing in mind, and that is making sure that all of our members uh, are on a path uh, for the year, a, a plan, and also really a scorecard that we can present to our constituents at the end of this session and also uh, at the end of the biennium. We work on a two-year biennium. And so what doesn't get done this year, we still have next year to work on. But we've got a lot done. Uh, we truly have. So we started out this year. I, I went to uh, um, uh, Senate President Ty Masterson. Actually, it was probably about August of last year. And I said, you know, we need to go out and we need, we need to talk to all of our members and really find out what's important to them. Because we've really never had a plan. In my 11 years, we really never have had a plan of how we were going to proceed through uh, the legislative session. It was always kind of reactionary. We just reacted to whatever was thrown at us. And I thought, we really need to have a plan. We need to have a roadmap of how we're going to move through this. And so uh, Ty went to all of his members, which I got to tell you, it's a whole lot easier going to 28 than 85. So uh, he had a, a whole lot easier a task of going and talking to 28 people. But we met with every single one of our members just to find out what was important to them and what was important to their district. And then we accumulated all of that information when we, when we finally finished and came up with a plan called A Better Way. And the better, A Better Way is really nothing more than truly a roadmap. Uh, it gives us a place to start and a place to put all of our uh, bills in as we develop them. And so the better way is, was made up of eight buckets. And those eight bucket, buckets are our commitment uh, to our taxpayers. It's your money. Our commitment to health, our commitment to students, our economy, our commitment to growing the workforce, protecting the vulnerable, law and order, our commitment to safe and secure Kansas, and our commitment to freedom, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We had ideas about what would go in those, but we really didn't want to start out with bills because what we wanted is we wanted this to be a bottom-up plan. We wanted it to be a plan that our members would latch a hold of and say, it's ours. It's our plan. And so when we rolled it out, we had about 80 representatives and senators behind us as uh, Ty and I presented it to the media that day. First time I think I can ever remember in my 11 years that we had all of those members standing behind us saying, this is what we're going to do, and this is the way we're going to do it. And, and so, literally, if you're getting uh, newsletters from your, uh, from your representatives and senators, I would imagine every time they're going to have something about a better way plan and what we've done uh, in, that, uh, in that vein. And so it's been very successful. They have really taken it on as their own because it is their own. It was their ideas. And as we went through the session, We've probably had about 800 bills introduced maybe in the House and the Senate total, uh, maybe a few more than that. We have over 200 bills that fit in the Better Way plan. And as we have passed them, we stick them in and now we've got a scorecard. So when we go back to our constituents at the end of this year and certainly next year when it's election time for all of the Senate and the House, we have something to show of what we did this last two years. And so it's been a very important thing, but it's been rewarding watching our members really 
look at that plan and, and drive it forward. Because truly, that's how it works, is, is if, we, if we're all driving in the same direction, we're going to get things done. Well, we have got a lot of things done. One of the first things I want to talk about before Leo jumps up here, and I don't want to take all of the credit uh, for anything, because truly, it's our members. Actually, I just get, as a speaker, I just get to be the guy that kind of keeps us all going in the same direction. Uh, it's really them that does everything. I started out this year with, with the idea of I'm going to select chairman, chairman who are going to drive uh, our agenda. And we had 26 committees in the House, and we have 26 uh, chairmen or chairwomen and uh, vice chairs. And they've all done a fabulous job. And I do want to credit um, Leo with doing a huge amount of work in the Utilities Committee. We haven't had, yeah, give him a hand. Seems like the last few years we haven't had uh, a lot going on in the Utilities, uh, Energy and Utilities Committee, and this year that's changed. And we have a, a chairman who is willing to stand up and be counted uh, because he knows how important it is, and I'm going to let him tell about it because he knows more about it than I do, but, but he knows that it's important for all of our businesses in this state and our residents uh, how much it costs them and utility costs and what he, is, he has really done to try to bring that cost down. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about that because he can talk about that. Probably one of the biggest things that's happened just recently is the override of the governor's uh, Fairness in Women's Sports Bill. You know, it's, a, it, it's really a shame that anybody could look at that issue and think that it's right for a uh, biological male to be able to compete against females in their sports. We have worked years, this nation has worked years uh, to give uh, women their, uh, uh, the ability for them to compete against women in sports. It's called Title IX. It was a, it's, a, it's a national thing. It's not a state thing. And all of a sudden, where is everybody protecting Title IX? Even the press. The press makes fun of us for, uh, for, for uh, passing uh, the, the uh, fairness in women's sports. So last week, uh, we did. We passed it. Um, actually, yeah, it was last week. Uh, maybe it was a week ago. I, I forget about time now. It was, I think it was on a Wednesday, if I remember correctly, when we overrode the governor on that. And the next three days was pretty brutal on uh, all of our folks in the House and the Senate. Um, there was stuff put on Twitter that was so vile it was pathetic. Uh, literally calling us perverts, calling us, uh, saying that we were going to check genitalia, Nowhere in that bill will you find anywhere where it says that. Nowhere. But it went viral. It went across the nation. And literally, over the next three days, I received one death threat. I received one person that came to my house and wanted to cause some problems. I had over 700, over 700 people from across this nation make vile calls to me. I'm not the only one that got it, though. Virtually anybody that had any, anything to do with passing that bill got the same treatment. Barb Wassinger out, and representing Barb Wassinger out in uh, Hayes, she got a ton and ton of calls and emails. Leo, everybody, every one of us got stuff from all over this nation. And it's amazing today how vile and how nasty people can be. It just, it, 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 it would, if, I, if I was to hold my phone up and let you listen to some of the stuff that they said, you would be appalled. Matter of fact, you wouldn't even want to hear it, it's so vile. But that's the, that's the world we live in today. It's, it's like people are not, they do, they do not look at us as human beings, the people up there doing the things that we do, that we're just something to be abused. So I, uh, I really feel for all of the people that, that get into public service and try to do the right thing and try to protect, especially try to protect women and then just be uh, treated in such a horrible manner. A lot of it's by the press. The press, the press helps that along. Uh, the press has not reported very well on that. Uh, they, certain, they certainly haven't uh, reported our side. Uh, they literally go after us. So as you can see, I'm not a fan of the press. I don't care about the press anymore. I've got to tell you, that's one thing this job will make you realize. The press really causes a lot of the problems that we have. So women's sports was a big deal. Uh, we got through that. And then we moved on to actually three full days on the floor of the House and the Senate uh, trying to get things done. And the next big thing I want to talk about is the tax bill. 
You know, we started working on that tax bill clear back at the start of session. And our idea truly was, and it ended up becoming a tax package, uh, but our idea was is to get a single rate tax. People call it a flat tax, and it's really not a flat tax. A uh, flat tax is really a misnomer. It's a single rate tax. The Senate started out at about 4.75%. Actually, that was their first uh, bill that came out. Ours came out at 525. And through, through conference, we had to get to a place where we could get a veto override on each side. And so it's a, it's a, negotiating, it's a no negotiating thing back and forth to get to a point where we believe that we could get a veto override because we know the governor has told us, she's told us many times, that she will not sign a, she called it a flat tax, I'll call it a single rate tax, she won't sign that. But there's some things in there that she wants. That tax package was actually a very good tax package. Not only did it have a single rate of 515 when it was finally passed out of the House and Senate, which is, our current rate's 57, figure it up, 5.5% lower, that's not a bad deal. Um, I'll take it, I think you'll all take it. But it also had uh, the, the tax, uh, the, uh, doing away with the tax on uh, food. Uh, we had actually, a year ago, started down that road. We did it, we did it over a three year period. Um, actually, our very own Derek Schmitz, the one that, that actually first proposed it publicly, as a House and a Senate, we'd been trying to get uh, do away with uh, sales tax on food for a long, long time. We just never could get the amendments to work. I remember one year, our uh, very own here in Wichita, John Whitmer was there, and I think he proposed an amendment 12 different times on the floor to do away with the sales, uh, sales tax on food and just never could get there. Uh, but this year, or last year, we got it over a three-year period. Uh, the governor uh, went on a... Uh, um, Let's call it just a tour, a tour of axe the tax. Now, she was using a hatchet. She doesn't know the difference between a hatchet and an axe, but that's okay. Uh, she went around the state, anywhere she could get a grocery store, they'd let her come in in, in a photo op and talk about axe the tax. That is a part of this tax package. So in January 1 of next year, if she signs it, uh, we will not have sales tax on food anymore. That, that's a big deal. Also, one of the largest segments of our population that leaves the state of Kansas every year is our seniors. And why? Because Kansas is the fifth worst state to retire in in the nation from a, from a tax standpoint. So we really needed to do that. If you remember back to the campaign of last year, um, again, Derek Schmidt came out with the plan to do away with uh, income tax on Social Security, pensions, and all retirement plans, 401k plans, everything. No state tax on any of those. When we started looking at it, it was pretty expensive. It was actually more than we could handle. And so we really started trying to pare that back because we still need to do work on keeping our seniors here in Kansas. And so we really looked, we really uh, uh, honed in on, on, the, on the Social Security, the income tax on Social Security. Our, our law currently from last year basically said that if you make $75,000 or less, not just Social Security, but all of your income, if you make $75,000 or less, you will pay no state tax on Social Security. If you make $1 more, you will pay clear back to zero on your Social Security. You'll pay it all. You'll pay income tax on all of it. So this year, we've moved that up to $100,000. So we're doing away with the cliff to where we don't have that cliff of being at $75,000 and then $1 more. Uh, we'll be able to get to $100,000 and, and not have that cliff. So that's a big deal. Doing away with that cliff is a huge deal. In addition, there is a, uh, a small uh, decrease in tax for our, our businesses and also for our banks. The banks don't pay actually any um, income tax. They pay a privilege fee. And so we lowered the privilege fee on banks just a little bit in there. Uh, so that package, that whole package is actually under 500 million. When I, when I started this year, I went to our appropriations chair, uh, Troy Waymaster from uh, Bunker Hill, and I said, how much can we spend on a tax cut? Because we really truly wanted to do three things. We wanted to have target tax cuts, we wanted to put more money in our rainy day fund, and we wanted to pay off a little bit more debt. And he said, 500 million, Dan, is about all we can really afford to do this. And I'm proud to say our tax chair kept us under 500 million. Actually, that's a, it's going to be about oh, uh, the mid 400, uh, about 400 and 
50, 460 million the first year. It grows up and then it comes back down in the third year. We're back down into that uh, under 500 million. So uh, we've actually accomplished exactly what we wanted to do. So in addition, uh, in the governor's budget, the governor had um, 500 million going into our rainy day fund. It's called the budget stabilization fund. Um, we actually put a little bit more than that in there in our budget. So we really, we really believe we have to be prepared, you know, fiscally prepared for a downturn, which we all think are, is coming. We just don't know when. Uh, so whenever that recession does hit, we need to be able to make it through uh, with our rainy day fund to where we don't have to raise taxes. We don't want to ever raise taxes again. And so it's important for us to save some money back into that. In addition, we have two lakes that we still owe uh, about 50 million on, and we're gonna start uh, retiring that debt. So we're gonna continue every year as we go back. We're gonna continue to, if we've got the funds to put money in the rainy day fund, uh, we've done our targeted tax relief, which is really a good tax package, and, and then throw in the fact that we're gonna get rid of, uh, continue to get rid of debt as we can. You know, last year we put over a billion dollars, actually I think it was a billion two, into the um, uh, CAPERS fund, uh, the, the unfunded liability. And we got some folks here, uh, Nick Hoheisel, Representative Nick Hoheisel has worked uh, tireless, tirelessly on uh, our pension plan. Uh, if there was somebody that could talk to you about ESG, it'd be him. Uh, he, he has lived ESG, probably, he probably is tired of ESG. <laughs> uh, you know, we got, we got uh, Avery Anderson here, who is our, uh, our transportation and safety budget chair, has done some wonderful things. And of course, we've got Leo, we got Paul Wagner here. Uh, we have truly a great group of representatives in the State House, and it's been my pleasure to be able to uh, help be a part of the leadership and, and guide uh, the way we've done this year. I really think that we've done some great things. I could talk a whole lot longer because we got a lot of stuff we've done, but I do want to turn it over to Leo and let him tell you some of the great things that uh, um, some other folks have done, including him. Leo? Wow, it's always good to be up here and see you guys. Uh, I just like started out by saying we did it. We had a truly successful year. Part of that, I'm gonna ask, has anybody heard the term form, storm, norm, and perform? We got one hand back here. That's how you get groups together. And you, you form the groups, you storm a little bit, trying to figure out where bodies fall out, who's doing what. Most organizations hit the norm. That's where you just kind of go along, picture the normal work culture. Very rarely you hit what I would call the performance side. And I really think that we hit it up there in the legislature this year. Um, there's a lot of stuff I could not have done without this guy sitting over here. And what I'm gonna tell you about on a few of the bills that we ran through numerous times, we had uh, utility people, we had different companies would show up in his office trying to get him to back me off on these different things. And his stance all along was, I appointed him as the chairman, he's got his job to do, and I will back him, and I could not have done that without you. Thank you. So, what, would, what did we do? He mentioned earlier about your, mo your money or a better way of doing things. Uh, the first one I'm the, the most proud of is House Bill 2225, and it was signed by Laura Kelly yesterday, and that's known as the Transmission Delivery Charge Bill. Um, what does it do? I'm, I'm just going to hit on a few highlights here, but to, before I could get that going, I, I met when we got up there in January with the KCC. I was getting nowhere. I met with Evergy. I was kind of getting the old rhetoric of what we've heard all along. I met with other groups, and I just wasn't getting what I needed to find out what drives the cost of electricity in Kansas. And when you get into co-ops, municipalities, it varies a little bit. But back to the Evergy side, their, their charges and their rates are based on return on equity. And it's when they put in new projects, and those new projects have a couple of buckets. One is for what's known as FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Just think federal projects. The other is based on state projects. And when we dug in, and we kept digging, and we kept digging, 
we, under, we uncovered $22 million in previous overcharges that will be refunded to whoever sits in this room that is an Evergy customer. So that's part of it's coming your way. <laughs> then I went after, I'm going to say kind of past and present and future projects, so from 2022 to 2026 and identified 80% of those future projects were going to be charged off to the FERC or the federal level. And why is that important? And that's the part we had to find out here. When you do a project for a federal level, it guaranteed, Evergy, a 10.3% return on the investments. Okay, keep that number in mind. But when you look at it and find out 80% of those were local Kansas-based projects, they should be run through the KCC, the Kansas Corporation Commission. That carries a 9.3% return on the investment. So when you do the math on the amount of investments going up here, that equated to another $11 million in rate reductions on day one when this thing got signed yesterday. Okay. Now, going forward, and again, because of where they're charging these off and the rates they can charge, it's going to equate to approximately another $2 million annual reduction in rates. And I'm going to say that the term they're using is it pancakes. It's $2 million next year, $2 million on top of that the next year, and $2 million on top of that. So it kind of adds up as we go here. So we also had another bill that we rolled into it. It was House Bill 2155. And in doing this, it actually gives the KCC more insight to future rate cases going through the power companies. And for example, Evergy or the others, they will actually be required now to file testimony regarding the regionally competitive rates and how those rates will impact the local economies throughout Kansas. So it's a, it's a factor we never knew before and it's something that now we've got a little oversight on too. Um, so that gives over, better oversight there. Um, I've had some reach out and say, well, gee, that's not that big of a savings. It is. <laughs> and if anything, it, it's, it's year one. I am a freshman ch uh, chairman up there at the Energy, and I've, I've got my sights focused, and there's other things we're going to keep moving forward on for, the, for everybody here. So hopefully that will help moving on. A few other bills that we got into that I wanted to point out. Um, I don't know if anybody around here lives out by the any big wind towers for the generators where you got the blinking lights constantly and that's all we're hearing and concerns about that. That was Senate Bill 49 and it it requires any future projects, and I'm going to jump into this a little bit more, but it requires future projects of wind tower sites or wind farms to provide what's known as light mitigating technology. And that's simply, it's a radar beacon, and it's looking at ground level up to about 1,000 foot high. And if it's, it will keep the lights off at night, so you've got your nice night stars, you've got your night sky out in the country, and if that radar detects anything within that beacon from, I think it goes out five or six miles, it will then light up the lights so that airplanes know. Um, the thought with capping it at 1,000 foot, if you're above 1,000 foot, it, it's not something you're gonna have to worry about unless you're a dive heading down and you'll catch it eventually. But, but anyway, that, that helped a bunch. And then we also, as part of this, we were one of the first states not to force retroactiveness because that gets into constitutional issues there, but rather these wind farms and providers go through what's known as PPA, power purchase agreements from time to time. They have contracts, some are as short as five years, others up to 10 years, so, and it varies there. So what we did is when they renew their contracts at that point in time, any existing wind farms must come into compliance at that point in time. So they'll be fitted with that. So the, the big concern is, oh my gosh, we're only gonna catch the ones going forward and we gotta live with all these others. And there's a bunch out there. We're pushing probably 4,000 towers in the state of Kansas. They will be brought up to code uh, in hopefully a five to six, seven year time frame, and we'll get her done. Um, and then we ran into another one, Senate Bill 144. That was an interesting one to me. 
Uh, anybody here have like Dish Network or DirecTV where you're getting it on a little satellite receiver at your house? I'm sure there's a bunch here. But we had a bill that looked at facility charges in right-of-ways. Now, anybody here ought to know, if I'm getting it from a satellite bird in the sky and the signal's coming down, we're not using the right-of-ways, right? They're sending, sending a signal to your satellite dish. Well, there's municipalities and so forth. There's actually a couple of outstanding uh, lawsuits going on from municipalities that they wanted a cut of that signal because it hit their right-of-way. And so then we looked at it even further, and they were also trying to get companies such as, and I'm just gonna pick on Cox, this is the random one I'm gonna pull out here. Cox has fiber or cable or so forth that does run down these right-of-ways, but then they also, in addition to taxing that, wanted to start taxing the different content for the streaming channels. So think of that as you, if you take the turnpike heading up to Topeka, you pull on the turnpike, you get a charge for your vehicle. They don't charge you for everybody in that vehicle. So what this was doing, it was a tax on your car, and then they were gonna turn around and do it again on every passenger in your car. And that's where we were saying, no, this is not right. Uh, so. Anyway, that got signed yesterday by the governor as well. So um, there was a couple of bills now, I'm not sure if you've heard anything. Have you heard anything about 1603, HCR 1603? That was a resolution urging the President of the United States to restore energy independence to the United States. And it passed through. <laughs> did it get signed? It did. Okay, I, I, I'm asking Dan. I did not hear if it got signed by the well, governor. It's a resolution. It, so it's just gone through. Yeah, okay, so, okay, so that will be a letter going up to Biden. Uh, just urging him to get energy independence restored back. Is it going to go anywhere? Don't hold your breath, please, but at least we're trying. That's, that's all I can say on that one. Um, there was also a couple bills that we purposely did not pass. Um, there was one, if you remember there earlier this year, I think it was in January or so, we had a pipeline spill up in the northern part of the state, part of the Keystone Pipeline. And I've been in pretty close contact with them guys as they're going through the cleanups getting the mitigation, getting everything back to normal, and finding the root cause of the issue. Leave it to the Democrats. They tried putting a bill together, it was House Bill 2327, to take and start taxing them more because of their pipelines. And I'm thinking as soon as you do that, and we're talking state taxes, you know how easy it is to route around the state on certain pipelines, because it's not just one or two going through, it's a, it's a conglomeration of pipes out there. But it was just their little way of trying to tick away at them and see if we can raise taxes a little bit more. Uh, that one did not go anywhere. Um, we had another one that was from another Democrat. They were wanting to increase the fees you pay on 911 services on your, uh, I believe it comes on your phone bill, it's probably a 50 cent fee or whatever it is on there but they were just wanting to increase the fees even more. And again, why? And when we looked at it, I couldn't justify what the additional money was for, and I didn't even have the 911 people asking for it. So that one purposely did not get, get run. There was another one that was introduced that really intrigues me. Actually, there was a couple there. We looked at the KCC, and right now we have three KCC members, Kansas Corporation Commission members, who are appointed by the governor. And the question I've gotten, we're trying to run through is, should they be appointed positions or should they be elected positions? And we're looking at what's the right move on that? And if they are, either way we go on that, we're gonna look at maybe doing something on that this coming year. I've got a bill that's in there and it's live, but I've got two bills. One is for electing and another is, do we maybe keep them as appointed? Because I've looked at other states and some have appointed, some have elected, and some who have moved to the elected version have moved back because they realize big bucks from big utilities can come in and kind of start picking and choosing who they get in these statewide elected positions. So we got to look at that closely, the ramifications. But right now there's three commissioners. And if any of you guys know anything about the Kansas Open Records and the meeting laws, the Kansas meeting, open meetings, if you have three total commissioners and any two of them just get together for coffee and want to discuss anything, that's a violation. 
because they suddenly have a quorum. You got two thirds meeting. So do we look at maybe kicking that number up to five where at least a couple of them can get together and speak and go, you know, go through bills just like we do on a daily basis. So that's something else I'm going to be looking at uh, working on this next year. And with that, I think I'm going to cut it off and open it if people have questions. But it has been a very successful year up there. So okay. thank you. I'm going to open this up for Packet Room Club members first. And uh, uh, please uh, get a question in. And In regards to the uh, women's sports bill, as you know, the, can the United States Supreme Court has ruled that transgender, whatever you want to call them, are going to be able to pay, are going to play in women's sports. Is that going to nullify what you guys just passed? So the uh, the president, your you know, president, came out with uh, uh, an executive order or something like that here just what this week. Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, ruled against allowing trans, ruled for a transgender to play in sports, in women's mm. sports. I hadn't heard that one. Yes, correct. It is That's correct. So it may, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard about the, yes. I knew the president came out and he's, he's messing around in Title IX and trying to make it to where uh, it nullifies every state that's done something. I'm not sure that that will stand up. Uh, we'll see, because that'll probably get tried in court this too. Is the U.S. Supreme so, Court we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Well, they, they actually they'll have to bring suit, which I'm sure they will. So we'll see what happens. Where everything we do subject to being sued. Uh, every every bill we do up there, somebody that doesn't like it can bring a suit, and the courts end up making those decisions. So we'll see how that goes. Just have to wait. Yeah, what's your opinion? What's wrong with a flat tax with no deductions? So, so I don't. I, I personally like flat tax. I think the single rate tax gets us to where we can get a, a veto override because we have to get to a veto override. Flat tax, we probably couldn't have got there. Uh, it's all you know. A lot of people say, why can't you get certain things done in the legislatures? Because you got to get. Uh, if we've got a, de a Democrat governor, we got to get 84 votes. If we've got a Republican governor, most of the time it's 63 votes. So right now we're in the 84 vote uh, category, it means we have to have two thirds of the people agree with us. Um, you know, it's tough. It's tough to get 84 uh, people to agree on everything. And when we were at uh, when we were at uh, 525, I would say that we probably had uh, easily well over um, probably into I guess probably around 96 votes. When we dropped it to 515. Uh, in negotiation with the Senate, because we have to have both sides agree, uh, we went from 96 votes down to 85 votes, just dropping that that little bit. And so everything we do is about getting enough votes to pass something. Uh, flat tax is not, a real flat tax is not something that we could get 84 votes for. So it's just simple as that. We have, we, we work on a math, uh, on, a, uh, on truly a, a set of maths, and that is, if we've got a, a governor that agrees with us, it's 63, 21, and 1. Governor signs it. If it's the way we are for the last four years and now for this next four years, it's 84, 27, and 1. Uh, so we have to really work hard to get some of that stuff done and get the votes for it. It's yeah. just a matter of getting the votes. Was real common yeah. So, and I, I just wanted to re throw something in here too, but I've actually had several from my district reach out and they're concerned about the, as we call it, the flat tax, not for who those of us in this room, but for the really low end income earners. So that was the reason they put a, a deductible on there. Right now, I think the really low end is making what, 3.1 or 3.5 percent is what they're current saying. law, current law, current, current law. law. Yeah. So by having a little bit higher deductible, yeah, they're subject to the 5% or whatever it is on the flat tax, but they'll have a higher deductible, so it will balance out and keep the lower in at the lower rate so moving we take, forward. So we actually, we actually took and slid that over. It was like the first 3,500 was exempted. Now we're clear over to 6,150, and we had to do that uh, and then start up on our single rate. Uh, otherwise, uh, people on the low end would be taxed, and we don't want that. That we want to we want to make sure that they also get 
a tax cut. So everybody on this plan, everybody got a tax cut, every single person. So this is for Leo. Uh, usually we talk about utilities, we talk about gas, electric, water, and you talk mostly about electricity. Was there anything on the other utilities going on? There, there is quite a bit. I've been meeting quite a bit with uh, uh, gas utilities. Obviously, you guys know what the gas prices happened over the storm URI, I think it was called, uh, February of 21. Um, looking at the recovery costs they've got going on right now, is that the true amount that they should be re re receiving back? It's something we're definitely looking at and working with. Uh, met with Southern Star quite a bit. That's one that a lot of you may not have heard, but we look at Southern Star as far as who drives the rates. Because if you go to Black Hills, you go to Kansas Gas, they are simply a retailer. And I'm not even sure in their structure of charges, I don't think they have a true markup on the gas. They're pushing the gas through at, at, at what they pay for it, but then there's a charge for the delivery and the the service and the pipelines and that kind of stuff so the focus is really what's driving the price and i started negotiating not negotiating but meeting with southern star and some of the people that actually drive that more to report back to you next year as we get into this again water now go ahead if you yeah, got so, something now so we really spent a lot of time on water this year uh one of the things that i thought was Actually, from all of my trips last year, everywhere I went across the state, somebody talked to me about water. And so we kept the water committee. Uh, our, we put uh, Cindy Howerton from here in Wichita as the vice chair, and then Jim Minix out in western Kansas as the chair. Uh, they, did, they didn't get all they wanted to, but they finally got some permanent funding um, uh, for uh, the water office and, and all of the water issues about 30 I think it was 35 million is what we put into water for this year so they could really start doing some of the work that they that they need to do uh, in addition they're working on developing uh, their plans uh, how to use that in and how to get folks to uh, voluntarily uh, start conserving water because we're really we don't like to mandate anything uh, mandates are not necessarily always good um, but we do have to, water is important, just as important here in Wichita as it is in Western Kansas. And so that water committee actually worked very, very hard this year. They got a lot more work to do. So we'll, it's a separate committee from utilities, uh, but certainly they're going to continue their work and, and they're going to do some great things out of that committee. Yeah. Yep. Real quickly, this kind of relates back to water, but not quite on the same subject. Um, in working with uh, KU Geological Survey individuals and the, the chief scientist up there, I, you guys probably have heard that I'm a big pusher for hydrogen production and so forth in the state. Just recently, we are verifying that what's, I'm gonna say what's causing the earthquakes in the past here, it's not fracking, it's the salt water injections going down in there. We're finding out and verifying that, yes, that's an extremely brine mix, but it can be filtered enough so that we can do electrolysis and actually get the hydrogen out of that waste product. So that, it, and the reason I bring that up is everybody's concerned hydrogen production, that takes X amount of water. We don't have the water in the state. I'm hoping maybe we can move forward with this thing using a waste product in the state instead. And we are in the very final stages. We sent off two weeks ago, I believe, for the final, uh, to the Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. Uh, looks like we're looking at about $1.2 in grants, and we've already got private uh, companies who are stepping up to say we'll match that to get this thing kicked off and going. So just a little, little thing to keep in your mind. Thank you so much for being here. What can we do to eliminate the roll rule in Kansas Constitution? The what? Convention of States. Oh, convention of states. So we had uh, we actually had two votes this year on convention of states. Uh, one was on term limits. It was brought brought by brought by a term limit organization. Uh, that one only got what was it? Seventy votes, sixty-eight votes. I think it was sixty-six votes is what that one received. We have to be at eighty-four. Uh, the actual convention of states uh, bill or resolution uh, got around seventy three or 74 votes, something like that, 74. 
Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the thing, not everybody believes in the Convention of States. Not everybody believes in a constitutional convention. Uh, in our own ranks, in the Republican Party, we probably have five or six uh, folks that will never, ever vote for that. And no Democrats vote for it. So until we can get enough Republicans to hit 84, uh, we can't get there. No, I go one step forward. If you take the rogue rule out of the Constitution, you only need the majority. So if you, if you take it out of the Constitution, you've got to have 84 to get that too. So any constitutional amendment that we do has to have 84 in the House, 27 in the Senate, and all of our voters have to vote for taking that out. Uh, we can't get to 84. That's our problem, is we can't get to 84. Uh, we've tried. Ever since I've been there 11 years, and I've probably taken seven or eight votes on Convention of States. I've, I've supported it. I've brought it up as majority leader, brought it up again this year as speaker. We just can't get enough folks to vote for it. Yeah. Hi, well, first of all, I want to thank you for all of your hard work. I live in Derby, and we dealt with a new issue with our Recreation Commission um, being sneaky and trying to put policy in that allowed transgenders in the locker rooms. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, we found out about it, we fought it, and it was overturned. So we about that. But I'm curious about the Women's Bill of Rights, where that stands, and whether we're going to get passed, overridden if necessary. Right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's actually on the governor's desk right now. We passed it. Uh, we did not pass it with an over uh, with a an override majority, a veto override majority. I think, if I remember correctly, on the Women's Bill of Rights, I think we maybe got 70 votes. So we would have a long haul to get to a an override. I do expect the governor to veto. As a matter of fact, uh, today I would I would pay attention to your um, email if you get email from the state. Uh, probably going to have a couple of vetoes today. Uh, the governor always likes to do them on Friday late in the day, hopefully bypassing the press, because um, even though the press may agree with it, they're still going to report uh, that she vetoed it. Uh, so I would say we'll probably have two vetoes. Eddie, Eddie Eagle, uh, she'll probably veto that one. Uh, she'll probably uh, veto the uh, Born Alive Act, uh, which is absolutely horrible. I don't know how anybody in their right mind can think if a child is born through a botched abortion that you just lay them on a table and let them die. Uh, this bill is, is trying to stop that from happening. We actually had one of our members, Ron Bryce, who's a, a physician in uh, Coffeeville, Kansas, practiced for many, many years down in Texas. Uh, he gave a heart-wrenching, uh, truly a heart-tugging story from the well about how he, in his hospital, had a code blue. He went into, into the delivery room and couldn't understand what was going on because everybody just acted like everything was normal. And then all of a sudden he heard the baby crying over on a, a cold stainless steel table, left there to die. And he took the baby, went to the NICU. The baby did end up dying. Uh, but he said in his, I believe, I believe this was the figure, he said in his career he saw that happen 27 times. So anybody that says that it doesn't happen is wrong. And any press that reports that it doesn't happen, they're wrong. And they're just, they're just buying in to this junk uh, that's going on out there. Quite frankly, I don't, you don't have a freaking heart. You don't have a heart if you're just going to let a baby lay there and die. Amen. It's horrible. It's just horrible. Uh, so she'll probably veto that today. Bet you we'll have an override on that one. Bet you we will. And if I can add to that, too, one of the things that we would hear up there quite often about the Born Alive bill, well, what about the health of the mother? Well. Let me ask the, the, the women here, if the baby is born and the umbilical is cut, what has the health of the mother got to do with laying that baby on a cold table and letting it die? Yes, you have to address the mother. I agree with that. But it, the two have been separated at that point. And it goes back to, like he says, I, I, I can't fathom how that could happen. You, you don't have a soul if you're going to allow that to happen. So. How close are we to being charged for the air we breathe? 
What would that look like? <laughs> Just trying to be proactive. <laughs> that's what that's yours. <laughs> ah, yours would be great. Okay. <laughs> For you, there will be a special tax. <laughs> Yes, I was looking up in my brain to figure out what that number was, and I believe, I believe the tax bill that that's in is House Bill 2002. It has not been voted on by the House yet. It was uh, it was a CC uh, conference committee report. You know, we went till about 4:30 that last day. We still had four or five CCRs that we hadn't finished, and so we'll have to do those when we get back in 2002. Uh, House Bill 2002, there is a provision, a tax provision for a tax credit for pregnancy crisis centers. And we hope, we hope and pray that the governor will not veto that because there's some things in there that she likes. Uh, but certainly, uh, if there's anything in there to make her veto it, that's one of them because, of course, anything that has to do with with the, that you can tie to abortion, even though that has nothing to do with abortion, uh, because it is uh, something that we're trying to do, um, you know, to protect life. Uh, I'm, I'm sure she's taking a good look at vetoing that, but it is there. We hope it passes. Uh, there's quite a few, I believe the, uh, again, the Eagle, boy, they're so prolific. Uh, they put out a piece the other day about that tax bill and all the things that are in it. All the special interests are in it, and I don't think they actually said anything about that piece, but I'm surprised they didn't. Um, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I, uh, I, would, uh, I would hope that it does get signed because that's truly a good bill, but uh, luckily none of you read the Eagle, so we're probably in pretty good shape. <laughs> to talk about um, any lessons we've learned from the pandemic now that it's officially over and also touch base real quickly on uh, improving education K-12 and the whole continuing. Are you guys going to have any say or is it still just the, the courts are running the show? Well, there's still, there's still a lot of stuff that's actually going on having to do with the uh, pandemic. Um, we had um, a lot of people think that there were some bills that weren't going to get touched. Um, uh, Senate Bill 6, Senate Bill 315, and Senate Bill 314 uh, were ones that were kind of held towards the end, uh, trying to make sure that we had agreement, uh, that we could get those things passed. Uh, we actually uh, put that package together because it all kind of contained the same thing. Part of it was on, on uh, uh, both county and state health officers and what they can do. One piece of it was on that. One piece was one piece of it was on vaccinations. Uh, had a lot of different things on vaccinations there. Can't remember what the other one was. Uh, I think it was 314, but I can't remember what was in there. Um, we teed it up in the Senate and it failed last Thursday. Well, actually, it was Friday morning, early in the morning. Uh, they did not get enough votes to uh, pass it. So uh, I was actually kind of surprised. I was, I was really surprised that that failed. I really expected it to, 
to pass the Senate and come over to the House, and I think we could have passed it probably fairly easily. But you know, a lot of you know, it's a it's it's just a matter of votes. It's a matter of getting those uh, 20, uh, 21 in the Senate. We needed twenty one, and we didn't get it. Need need sixty three. And of course, the governor wouldn't have. She would have surely vetoed it, even if it passed. She would surely veto it. And we've got when we've got such a small total. It's just impossible for us to override it. Uh, it. It makes you sick, and I know you all are sad sometimes with some of the things that we don't get done, because uh, it makes us sad too, uh, because our people truly want some of those things, and we tried, uh, and we'll continue trying. Um, but that's how important it is to get the right governor. You know, this state elected Laura Kelly, and this is what we got now. Uh, so we have to deal with that. And I will tell you, probably by Next Friday, we will probably see 12 to 15 vetoes come out of the governor's office. So we're going to have lots of material to work on when we get back. Uh, we're going to be back uh, the week of the 24th through the 29th, um, working on vetoes and, and passing that, la that final budget, the omnibus budget. Um, so we got a lot of work to do, but a lot of it's going to be us, uh, especially uh, our leadership team and, and our WIP team just calling all of our members, making sure that we've got the veto uh, number so we can, uh, or the override number so we can override the governor's veto. Uh, my voice kind of dropped a little bit because it really is saddening. It, it, it's disappointing, it's frustrating for us up there, maybe just as frustrating for us as it is to you, maybe more frustrating because we work so hard to get things done and then we have a governor who really does not want to work with us at all. And quite frankly, uh, we expect it from her. We expect lots of vetoes. So, but we will keep working. We'll keep smiling. We will. House Speaker Dan Hawkins of the Kansas House and House Utilities Chairman Leo Delperman. Thank you all both. Have a great weekend.